Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. Let me also use this opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me to both this workshop and the entire fall. I, I'm really psyched about this. So I will give you a very, very basic uh, uh, introduction to exponential time algorithms. So uh, I, I will show a lot of them. And since I got confused about this, I tried to summarize what I'm doing while I do it on this, um, on this blackboard. Um, so, so this is the this is the plan. So there are many ways to slice this cake, and I, what I like to do is to just use the standard um, standard way of us grouping algorithms into boxes and see what comes out of it when you apply that framework to exponential time computation. So we will see almost all, all our friends here, except for uh, greedy. So I have a slightly longer talk where I try to squeeze in greedy as well, but it's very artificial. So, so, um, so this is the plan, and I will show you uh, a bunch of algorithms that fits in each of these um, um, boxes with various running time. I think nothing I will show you is optimal. Maybe down here a few things will be optimal. Okay, so the, the plan is very much to say that exponential time algorithms does not in any significant way differ technically from what we all know and love from polynomial time computation. Um, except, of course, that in polynomial time computation we will never use exhaustive search, but here we do. And there is a bit to say about this, so let me say this first. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, and since I have colored markers, uh, so I think I can stick to these three problems. Uh, Hamiltonian cycle, which uh, is the question of visiting uh, all the vertices in a graph exactly uh, once. And I'm, so here's one way of visiting all of them exactly once. Uh, graph coloring is a, so how fast can we do this? Well, naively just from the definition then, that would be, uh, this, there are potentially n factorial, where n is the size of the graph, or the number of vertices in the graph, n factorial different ways of visiting these. At least one of them will uh, find us the Hamiltonian cycle, so, so that would be our first algorithm for Hamiltonicity. Similarly, graph coloring, uh, we can color uh, this graph with, let me try to do it with two. Uh, that's not going to work, so I need at least a third color. So I can color this graph with three colors, uh, blue, white, and yellow. No red. Uh, and obviously I can do that in time k to the n, where k denotes the number of colors. So I just uh, check all uh, mappings from the vertices to the set 1, 2, 3 up to k. And uh, there are k to the n such mappings. One of them will be a valid coloring if that exists. Satisfiability. Um, so here's a small instance, the answer to which is, uh, let me run PPSC on this. Uh, no. So, uh, and obviously I can solve satisfiability by, by looking at all possible valuations of the variables. And independent set, which is just uh, a variant of this, uh, is to find a large independent set in this graph. And there's one way to screw it up, and then let me try to not do that. So there is an independent set here of size 2, namely the black one. And I can also do that in time 2 to the n. So, so the, the perfect talk would collapse the second and fourth column, but I couldn't find an easy way of doing that. Now, and, and you might say that everything about set is now said because obviously exhaustive search is just a question of iterating over all the possible witnesses there are. So some of these problems are in, are in NP. So there's a natural formulation of this problem as give me a witness and then there's a polynomial time computation left. So I can just iterate over all those witnesses and that gives me the exhaustive search algorithm. But there are a few things to be said about that. So we want to find a better than exhaustive search algorithm for, uh, we want to find better algorithms than exhaustively searching for a witness. But already this is not very well defined. Uh, so it's not quite clear what, what it is we are looking for. Uh, and here's an example. So three coloring, the thing we already have, have on the blackboard. So uh, for k equal three. So obviously I can solve that by looking for all witnesses. The witnesses are vectors of this length with these values. So I can do that in time three to the n. And once I have the witness, then it's a polynomial time computation to see that for every edge, so what, given the witness, I can now in polynomial time check for every edge that its endpoints are uh, multicolored. But if that's OK, then why is not the following OK as well? Uh, the wit it would suffice for me as a witness to see an, a set i 
an independent set. So, whoa, um, um, like this, with the following properties. It's independent, so its coloring number is one. This is the briefest way I can write that i is an independent set, so it has chromatic number one. Uh, and then, if the entire thing was colorable, then the then the um, complement will have to have a chromatic number two. And there are three candidate sets. At least one of them is less than one third of the size of the graph. So, so here is my suggestion for a much better witness. The witness is just the um, incidence vector of this uh, subset. And there are this many of them. So that's roughly this time. So sim, I'm, I'm being almost criminally sloppy with polynomial factors. And so all my running times are among friends. So put all these stars on your O's that you, that you want. So, um, OK, maybe I need a lemma for this instead. Don't worry. So, so the point here is that this is a polynomial time computation, and so is this. So it's easy to check if a graph is, uh, um, is too colorable by breadth first search. So uh, for k equal 3, we also have this algorithm, which runs in time 1.4 to the n, which arguably is still just search for a witness. Yes? So n to the n over 3 is probably larger than. Yeah, I probably need the uh, whatever the lemma is called. The number of maximum independent sets in a graph is? Hmm? 1.89. Yeah. That is very floppy. Yes, thank you. 1.89. Thank you. Very big O. OK. Um, OK, and another example, uh, instead of doing, uh, so, so here is a, uh, a witness so let me let me still um, expand the concept of checking a witness um, um, so here's Hamiltonicity in degree three graphs if there has a Hamiltonian path from s to t then it goes through some vertex v in the middle so the graph looks somewhat like this there's a Hamiltonian path in s running through half of the graph going through v and then running through the rest of the graph so um, so this predicate here, Hamiltonicity, so there in G there is a Hamiltonian path from S to T. If and only if there is a way to split G into two subgraphs, U and W, such there's, there's a path from S to V and then uh, from V to T. Um, and uh, uh, U and V are, have the same size, or rather these two subpaths both have length and half. Now, this thing I can... Um, if the graph has degree 3, then in every ver when I start here, oh, this was a really confusing illustration of that. So if the graph has degree 3, not 4, then at every vertex, once I start walking around, there are only two choices. Um, so in 2 to the n squared time, <laughs> why is it not 2 to the n over 2? Faster than you think. Uh, you can check this predicate, and you can also check this predicate, but you can put those all into a large table. So um, if we now, so, so here I did it right. Why can't I see it now? Okay. Degree maybe is four. Okay. So, so all of these predicates, I um, brutally, if you want, compute and store them in a huge table. So normally I don't have time for that in our standard um, understanding of what a witness is. But now I do have time and space for that, because I'm, I care about exponential time computation. So I do that once, and after that, I iterate over the remaining halves of the witnesses and check for each of them that they can be found here. So some people call this meet in the middle uh, or a, a time-space trade-off. Uh, in any case, it's, it's, it's surprisingly fast. Are you talking about for any splitting or for a particular? Such a splitting must exist. Don't you also have to search for the splitting then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a huge OR. We will revisit this, and I'm, this is, I'm, I'm not recurring in it, recursing in it. We will revisit this in a second. Uh, so, 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 depending on what your what your opinion of exhaustive search is, there is there are many non-trivial algorithms hidden up here already. Let me uh, quickly move on to local search. 
the other paradigm uh, that we know. I have this. So there is, a, there is only one important algorithm here, uh, and it's for 3CNF. So, um, so local search algorithms maintain a current assignment. Let me call that A. And I'm confusing 0 and false and true and 1. So there is a current assignment here of n bits, um, initially, say, random. And then I will locally improve this current assignment uh, as follows. So if I'm uh, in an optimum, so if I found an assignment that satisfies the input formula, then I'm done. Otherwise, in phi, there must be an unsatisfied clause. So under A must contain somewhere a clause L1 or L2 or L3 that is unsatisfied. So this thing under A um, is false. Um, so at least one of these three literals is uh, wrong. And I now flip a three-sided coin and uh, choose one of these and, and um, change the value of the variable indicated by the literal. And I keep doing that. So this, is, uh, this can be modeled as a Markov chain. So fix a single satisfying assignment. There may be many. Fix one. Let's call that B. Um, unknown to us, of course. And then consider the following n plus 1 state Markov chain. Uh, at the current time, uh, which, uh, where the states are the distances, the Hamming distance between our current solution and uh, the optimal solution B, one of the optimal solutions B. Now, um, if the distance is zero, uh, our current solution coincides with the optimal solution, so we are done. Um, and it's easy to recognize that situation, so that's this case. Otherwise, so in this literal, um, at least one of the valuations of the variables in this clause differs in A from what B gets, sets it to. So at least one of these, when I flip it, must move me closer to A. So uh, with probability at least one third, I will move closer to A in that direction. And then symmetrically, uh, with probability maybe as bad as two thirds, I will move in the other direction. So the behavior of this algorithm is uh, pessimistically modeled by this Markov chain, the one that moves exactly one step to the right with probability one third and one step to the left with probability two thirds. And then you plug that into a, so, so this is almost, if these said one half, then we would expect what square root of n? N squared. Yeah, n squared steps uh, until we hit uh, the barrier to the right. This is worse, so this will be biased towards the left. So once you do the analysis, you see that you, uh, after some steps, give up because you're probably too far to the left. Uh, start with a new uh, random valuation of A that will put you somewhere at random, and then again run the Markov, step for, the Markov chain for a number of steps, and unless you hit the barrier, you redo this a bunch of times. So this is um, um, an unexciting analysis of this, uh, of this Markov chain will give you that the expected running time of this is 4 over 3 to the n. So this is Schrödinger's algorithm. And for some reason, this seems to be one of the few local search algorithms we have in the field of exponential algorithm, which is strange. Why are there no flow algorithms um, uh, that with uh, interesting sub-exponential running times? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, there is more to say, but not today. So let's go to the two big, uh, big techniques here: recursion and transformation. So, of course, recursion again is a is a known um, algorithmic technique, maybe maybe the most important one we have, where we reduce a problem to uh, a version of the same problem, typically for a smaller instance of the problem, of the graph. And, and this comes in two flavors, decrease and conquer and divide and conquer. So decrease and conquer is like insertion sort, and divide and conquer is like merge sort. Right? Decrease and conquer is 
you want to sort all of these, and you do that by finding the largest element and then recurring on n minus 1 of them. And dividing congruent is you want to sort all of these, and you do that by splitting it into two and then recurring on, on these two. I think that is a useful distinction. And let's uh, take algorithms like this first. So algorithms that reduce the instant size by a constant rather than a constant factor. And, and here uh, uh, we uh, um, now meet probably one of the richest areas in, uh, in this field. Uh, these are m m normally these are called branching algorithms. So independent set this problem. So let's get the easy case out of the way. If the uh, degree of the graph is 2 or, or less, then that's an easy case because uh, so then the graph contains only, consists only of paths and cycles. And if it does, then uh, yeah, that's easy to solve. There are one. There's only <clears throat> one choice for each component, and it's easy. Um, otherwise, there is a vertex of degree 3. Here I managed to actually draw a graph of degree 3. Yeah. So uh, otherwise, there's a vertex of degree 3. Um, so consider that vertex. And now um, there are two cases. Either V happens to be in the um, independent set at the end, or it's not in the independent set at the end. So let's just build two new instances, one of them, uh, both of them, uh, uh, consisting of n minus 1 vertices. In one of them, we remember that this was now independent uh, in the independent set, and this is not in the independent set. And since we are changing one instance into two smaller instances, we get this tree, and this is why many people call these things branching algorithms. Here, we don't have trees. One instance is transformed into exactly one instance, so these are paths. Here, we have trees of instances. and. Uh, so what I did right now, not only doesn't it quite work, it's also not going to be impressively fast. But um, what you then observe is that once we decide that this vertex v should go into the independent set, well, then none of its neighbors can go into the independent set. So actually, we have reduced the uh, graph by one vertex over here, and we have reduced it by four vertices over here. None of these four vertices are in the uh, left sub-instance. Uh, so the recurrence, <laughs> 4. This is a 4. OK, so the, so the running time for the entire graph is then the instance to the right, which is n minus, has a size n minus 1, and the instance to your left, which has size n minus 4. And if you plug that in, then you get 1.39. I think this value I copied correctly from a textbook, and this not. So here's a. If the graph has at least degree three, then such a vertex exists. If there's a graph, if, if there's a vertex with even more neighbors, then this becomes only better. We can, I can throw away even more. But if the graph does not have degree three, but everything is two, then I'm in polynomial time. Um, these analyses typically vastly overestimate the running time of these things, because if you want to implement this, and of course, you look for the vertex of highest degree and branch on that. Uh, but this is a guarantee. So in practice, these things uh, seem to be very fast. But of course, it's unclear what that means. So let's look at another example, even older, uh, vertex coloring. So here's a graph. Uh, if the graph has no edges, then the coloring problem is easy. I can just count, color everything pink. Uh, now consider now the case where the graph has an edge, so the graph between uh, the edge between u and v. So if there's an edge between u and v, um, um, consider two uh, slightly smaller graphs. Uh, one graph called g minus uv uh, is the same graph where I have removed the edge uv. And in the other graph, I have contracted the edge uv. And it doesn't have a name anymore now. Okay. Consider a coloring of this graph. So the colorings of this graph come in two flavors. 
either the two old UV vertices have the same color or the same color or they have different colors. So every coloring of this graph falls either into this or into that box. Uh, uh, so red is a variable that stands for colors. Hmm? Um, now, these kinds of colorings where U and V have received different colors are isomorphic to all valid colorings in this graph. Because I can just add the edge. These colorings are isomorphic to all valid colorings in this graph because I can contra contract the edge. Okay, so I can count the uh, colorings in this graph by counting them here and here and adding these two values, or maybe more interestingly, I can count the colorings in the original graph by counting these colorings and then subtracting these colorings. Okay, so if P for a while, for a moment, denotes the number of colorings of the graph G, then P uh, satisfies this recurrence. The number of colorings in G is the number of colorings in G minus UV minus the number of colorings in G minus U contract V. And this is a now, again, a decrease in conquer recurrence. I'm not uh, recurring on graphs where I, throw away, where I throw away vertices, but on graphs where I throw away edges or contract them. But um, otherwise, the computation tree is again binary. Every instance produces two new instances. Uh, the recurrence now is, looks a bit harder to analyze because there are two parameters, the number of vertices and the number of edges. So in this case, the number of edges goes down. And in this case, which is this one, uh, both the number of vertices and the number of edges goes down. So one parameter to, uh, to analyze this under is the sum of these two values. So the running time in terms of n plus m satisfies this monovariate recurrence. So n plus m is either reduced by 1 or it's reduced by 2. And this is, of course, a famous recurrence known to uh, even the uh, readers of bad crime fiction um, because it uh, converges to the um, golden ratio. Hmm? And this, so this is the famous deletion contraction uh, recurrence by Fyodor. How do I say that? Zikov. Zikov. Oh, Zikov. <laughs> That's what I said, man. <laughs> okay, uh, and I, um, I have to apologize. I'm, I, um, not only are my bounds sloppy, um, I simply didn't find the time to put references on all my slides. Uh, so maybe I can upload them somewhere and put all the uh, names uh, there somewhere. Ah. Uh, one point. So this is, this is, it's seldom better than, than this, but sometimes it is. It's certainly a non-trivial algorithm. And as I said, optimality is not my, uh, my motivation here. I just want to show you a bunch of different algorithmic techniques and what they have to do in this uh, realm. Okay. Yeah. Better analysis of this algorithm because this recurrence doesn't seem to, I mean, your proof doesn't seem to be tight. Right? Well, I can show you graphs that have this many uh, subtrees. I mean, even if n is uh, much larger than n, because then. Uh, then you would prefer the other. There is an evil twin to this recurrence called the addition contraction routine where it's better to add edges. Okay, and let's uh, see what this has to say for three sad. Um, yeah, but you all know this, but let me just do it anyway. So if uh, if uh, all clauses have two literals, then this is just two CNF, which is easy. Otherwise, there must be a clause that looks like this. It has three literals called X, Y, Z. Um, and I will now produce four new instances. So in the first instance, I set X to true and clean up the rest of the graph. So that gives me one instance with one less variable. In the next instance, I set x to false and y to true and clean up the graph. Uh, so that gives me one instance of size n minus 2. And then there is one instance of size n minus 3 and one more. So because I'm not concentrating, I, I made this mistake. 
So, so that gives you this recurrence, which then unsurprisingly, of course, uh, gives you exactly what you started with because we haven't done anything intelligent here. But the observation is now, of course, that uh, these instances are useless because we already killed one of the clauses, so there's no way that the solution will satisfy the, uh, the entire graph. So we don't have to consider this case. There are only these three interesting cases. So this two goes away, and then you get this recurrence for 1.84 to the n. Not, not even close to optimal, but it's, um, it's a very uh, easy algorithm to convince yourself that they're non-trivial algorithms for three set. Um, so what does this have to say for Hamiltonicity then? So uh, if there is a path from S to T, then the path has to go from S via an edge to some neighboring vertex and then traverse the rest of the graph from V to T. So uh, if I express this as a recurrence, then there's a Hamiltonian path in G from S to T if and only if there is one from V to T where uh, V goes over all neighbors to S. So the idea is to start from S, then exhaustively uh, search through all neighbors, and then start a recursion in the rest of the graph, the light blue graph, starting here. That's G minus S? That's G minus... Probably g minus s. Yeah. yeah, it's g minus s. Thank you. So I'm tempted to sort of correct this, but Alistair won't be happy. Yeah. Yeah, it's g minus. It's unclear whether. Yeah, it's g minus s. I'm trying to. Okay, and this is of course a terrible idea because uh, so now I've reduced the problem of size n to a bunch of and probably many. These could be uh, all vertices, problems of size n minus one. So, oh, that's not even n factorial, it's worse, right? It's n to the n. Yeah, it's n to the n. Okay, but then the graphs become smaller, so probably n factorial. So hmm? Sorry? Your n's dropping, because you got g minus. Yeah, the n is dropping. Yes, fine. Yes, good. So I'm in good shape. So this is a terrible idea, but, uh, but it's not, because, uh, because as you see, almost all the... Um, um, so how many different uh, arguments do we call h on? H, these things, this is always fixed. This varies over n different values of v. And this is every subset of the graph in the worst case. So I'm never going to call this on more than 2 to the n different instances. So why don't I tabulate all of them? And this is, of course, the idea that goes back to Bellman. Um, so there are only n times 2 to the n different table entries. So I can uh, pre-compute all of them and put them in a table and never recompute them. And then the running time can't be worse than uh, what it took to fill out this, uh, this table. And this is, we know today by, the, actually, Bellman's term for this was dynamic programming. And, uh, and, and this algorithm, so this silly recurrence and this brilliant idea together is, uh, is of course, uh, super famous. So this is 2 to the n time. It's, and it's part of popular culture. Right? So everybody knows this because, um, because it, it appears in a webcomic. A webcomic, I point out, that is more diligent in actually putting correct running times in its uh, drawings <laughs> than I am. Uh, and of course, you can, you can go further and further back in time. If you, if you really want, then, then uh, uh, one of the all these examples of a decrease and conquer recurrence is the Laplace expansion for the determinant, which, as given here, again, uh, gives you a terrible running time. But uh, you can just memoize all these minors, uh, and there are only 2 to the n of them. So uh, the Laplace expansion gives you also roughly 2 to the n table entries, times n times n squared times 2 to the n table entries you can do with. So, uh, so you can do the determinant and also the permanent in this running time and have been able to do so since 1700. Actual. Dynamic programming is from 1959. But, uh, you can do the terminal faster. <laughs> terminal, yeah, there's, there's another algorithm for determinant that would appear in a hypothetical workshop on polynomial time computation. 
Yeah. But the, the beauty of this one is that it works even if, if, even if your occurrence isn't so friendly as to have a term here that makes everything cancel at the right time. So, so the same expression without that is the recurrence for the permanent, which didn't make the uh, cut, apparently. OK. We are doing swimmingly. Let me go back to the uh, recurrence I had uh, 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 early on for Hamiltonicity. So this is still true. And, and uh, why don't I now just, instead of using it only at the top, why don't I just recurse on this? So I can, I just managed to express H in terms of H. So I can run this recursively uh, instead of running it only, in, instead of what I did in the beginning to exhaustively compute this and build a table for this. I now take this as a recurrence and, um, and um, well, how many, how many partitions are there? There are n over n half partitions into roughly equal sized sets. And then you probably also have to multiply this by n. But the uh, subproblems have size n half. Um, so there's probably a factor n squared missing, uh, but nothing big enough to change uh, the correctness of this. So this, if you uh, solve the recurrence, gives you 4 to the n times, I think, n to the log n. This is non-trivial, so let's write this. This does not look so good in comparison to this, but this is a polynomial space algorithm. This algorithm uses no extra space. Um, and uh, and uh, one of the, um, so this algorithm used 2 to the n space and 2 to the n time. And this algorithm uses polynomial space and 4 to the n time. And so since 2 times 2 is 4, this um, seems to be important. But who knows? It's certainly an interesting problem to, to see if the trade-offs that exist between these things are, uh, are necessary. Uh, what is this? I have no idea. That's the factor that's multiplied by t of n over 2. I guess I want to also look at this, what happens when I memoize this recurrence. So So assume I want to fill a table with this. How many table entries are there? There are two to the n table entries. For every table entry, say the table entry of size r, I have to look at all ways to split uh, the subset of size r into two equal sized subsets. And there are roughly two to the r of those. So this will become the um, so. You're, you're missing an n choose k there in that, in that second term. Once you stick it in. Yes, it... exactly. I'm missing the n choose k here. Exactly. Tick this n choose k here as well. And then you get that, that if you throw dynamic programming after the recurrence, then you end at 3 to the n. So that's now worse than here and uses the same space. So here it turned out to not be a good idea. But you, you never know. So now the product between time and space is 6 to the n which is worse than both this and that. Ah, see, here I explain to myself what I, uh... <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, coloring. So, um, so this is the obvious um, recurrence for, uh, for coloring. And uh, when you do uh, the computation, it's, um, it's not going to be very good. So I, I, split the, I split the input into two sets. I have very little control over the large one. Um, so, so we get exactly, here I did it right. Here the binomial coefficient actually made, the, made it to the slide. Um, we get a 3 to the n algorithm for coloring. Uh, and this is lawless algorithm. So, so I split the thing into two sets. Um, compute recursively uh, the chromatic number of the left one, provided that's an independent set, so that chromatic number is always going to be 1. 
and then I, uh, I compute the chromatic number of the rest. So that's V minus I. So I look, I minimize over all subsets I for which the left side is easy, simply by running through all independent sets, and then the right side. Um, so it's a very lopsided uh, divide and conquer thing. Um, Okay, so and, and in order to do that, then at size k, I have to split into a two equal size set, which is roughly 2 to the k size. So that gives us this running time for graph coloring with exponential space. And this is Lawler, 1973. Uh, just for completeness, there is an other way to split the chromatic number into a sum of other chromatic numbers. Because, uh, so I will now tripartition the graph into three sets, i, u, and v, such that i is independent, so it has chromatic number one, and u and v each are less than half, si half the size of the graph. So you can always do that. Right? So there is a way, so u and v themselves are the unions of disjoint independent sets, so there is a way to distribute uh, these three parts such that neither of u uh, and v is larger than half the size of the graph. If there were, then I'd take out one of the independent sets and make that i. And that gives you this recurrence. So now x, uh, this is now a property divide and conquer recurrence into two different uh, subsets where I recurs on both of them. And so the, recurs, the recurrence is then going to be the number of tripartitions, so the number of ways to do this, uh, times two times the, uh, uh, the recursive calls here. And if you compute that, the outcome will be 9 to the n. So terrible, but in polynomial time. Polynomial space. Really. Polynomial space, thank you. Do you go here for three coloring or for so why are you looking for bipartization of each of the sets in normalization step? It's not, it's not three coloring. It's no, this is this is uh, this is k coloring. No, not k. It's just you do color. I find the chromatic number. I compute the chromatic number. I can compute the chromatic number of the graph by using these two divide and conquer algorithms. This one actually happens to be good. For twenty years, this was the best algorithm for chromatic number. For a long time, this was the best algorithm for chromatic number. And, and it's non-trivial, because uh, Q does not appear here. The number of colorings does not appear uh, uh, in the expression, which is surprising, because you would expect the number of colorings to appear. And indeed, there are some very easy constraint satisfaction pro problems that almost look like coloring problems, where uh, the number of uh, states or colors does appear. Um, OK. This was um, recursion, so where we take the problem and produce one or two or many uh, smaller versions of the same problem in some transformed graph. Remove an edge, remove a vertex, contract an edge, uh, or split the graph into uh, constant fraction sized subgraphs. Breathe. And now the next and uh, final family of problems is going to be transformation, where we take the problem and translate it into something else and then solve that problem and then translate the argument, uh, translate the result back. So this is reduction, if you want. Um, and most of the recent exciting uh, progress in this field has been here. And, uh, and there's simply too much for, for, for a talk. But let me just give you a, a, a whiff of what happens here. So, so here is one uh, prop. So, so all of these, all of the algorithms have the have the form that we take the problem and reduce it to something else that we know something surprising about. Um, so the problems on the right side, those we transform to, allow some surprising algorithm, and 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 here is one, um, the sum of two sets of vectors. So this this goes by many many names: split and list, meet in the middle, sort and search. So so here it is, at least in a toy version, we have two sets of vectors a and b and a target vector t in d dimensions, I want to find a sum where one term is from one set and the other term is from another set, such that the sum hits the target vector exactly. 
So here's an example. Here's my set A, and here's my set B, and here's my target T. So, and now you all run the uh, quadratic, the obvious quadratic time algorithm is to take this and compare it with that, and that's going to give us 0, 0, 3, 2, 1, and that's not going to work, and you iterate over all of them, and then after quadratic time, you uh, find that these match. Okay? And, uh, and the surprising thing is that you can do something better by one of the most important algorithms we have, namely sorting. Well, yeah, you laugh, but I mean, this is some... Sorting is, is, is highly non-trivial thing. So, um, so the idea is to first sort B, because every time I have a concrete vector on my left side and in my hand, I know exactly which vector on the right side I'm looking for. So if I had easy access to all of them, say by sorting or hashing or whatever your favorite data structure is, uh, if I could quickly look up, does this vector, in this case 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, exist in B? Yes or no, then I could, uh, then I could find it. And that gives me a faster algorithm. So, so how do we use that for an exponential time problem? Here's a toy example. Uh, exact uh, conjunctive normal form satisfiability. Uh, not even close to the fastest algorithm for this problem, but let me show it to you. So exact sat means that every, in a satisfying assignment, every clause has one and only one uh, true literal. So here is my example instance with five clauses. Um, and the transformation is now the following. I split the set of variables into two. Uh, Wx, the first two, and then everybody else, which will be z and y later. And now uh, construct all possible assignments to w and x. And I failed, because this should see tt. Okay, but so better people than I could actually, this is correct. So this should say false, 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 true, true, false, true, true. And uh, for each of these assignments, I compute for every clause the number of true literals in that clause. So for instance, let's take, let's take this guy. So uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So I claim that for the assignment W, uh, false, x false, this clause has exactly two true literals, and this is going to be true, and this is going to be true, and this I don't know. So this has two literals, or rather, this assignment leads to two satisfied literals in clause four. And I do that for all the clauses and for all the variables, so that gives me two to the n half rows and um, n columns. Okay, and now I, 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 most of you should now be able to see the reduction. So, so I do the same thing for the other two variables, y, z, the other n half variables. Uh, and here I succeeded. And uh, then you can see that I was actually, yeah, now you can all see that this thing, measures this. this is actually exactly the same instance that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so, um, so the target vector is now going to be a bunch of ones, one, 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 one. So uh, time and space is two to the n half, rather than two to the n. Two to the n half times n plus the time for sorting and so on. Um, so what, this is here, exact sat two to the n half, using exponential space. So what we've done here is to take a relatively small instance to our hard problem and transform it into a huge instance for our easy problem, solve that using a surprising algorithm for the easy problem, and then inter interpreted the solution back. Let me do that again, now uh, mapping to something else for which we know a surprising algorithm, namely uh, finding triangles, which exploits the fact that there's a surprising algorithm for uh, triangle multiplication. Matrix multiplication. So we want to find, we want to count the number of triangles in this graph, and there is one. And, and the uh, nice algebraic way of doing that is to consider the in, the adjacency matrix, take that to the third power, and then. Um, so what's the combinatorial interpretation of this thing? There's a two here, or there's a two here, because uh, you can go from this vertex. There are two length three paths that go from this vertex and back. 
Here's one, and here's the other. Uh, did I say path? Walks, right? So uh, non-self-disjoint walks of length three from V back to V. So in total, there are so there are two walk, walks from V back to V, uh, to here and to here and non here. As you can see. Um, so, um, so every triangle is going to be counted six times. Here, my one triangle is going to be counted six times, one for each of these vertices in both directions. So algebraically, one-sixth of the trace of A cubed is going to be the number of triangles in the graph. So instead of triangle counting or detecting, you can take the incidence matrix, take it to the third power. And since there is a surprising algorithm for matrix multiplication, you can do this faster than the naive algorithm. Right? So to sum this up, there are two ways of finding triangles. One is to look at all sub, or to, to, it, to iterate over all pairs of three vertices and see do they form a triangle. Or you could do this and plug this into your favorite matrix multiplication algorithm, which will be, which will uh, have a running time of ta um, uh, of the dimension of the matrix. In this case, n to the omega, where omega is a number surprisingly much smaller than three. So how do we use that for our problem? Let me find a k clique, and uh, I could only draw a six clique instance for you. So the example is k clique. Uh, here's a concrete instance for k equals six. I will build myself from this smallish instance, I will build a huge instance to the triangle detection problem and then solve that using the matrix multiplication algorithm. So there will be one vertex here for every k over three clique here. So the k over three cliques are just the edges, which means I can actually draw this. So, so, so this two clique uh, is this vertex, and this two clique is this vertex, and so on. So there's one vertex for every k over three clique in the original instance. And then there is an edge between two two cliques, if and only if they are as connected as they can be. So let me show an example. This two clique, the red one, and this two clique, the green one, all their endpoints are connected. This is uh, quickly checked. And uh, so I put an edge there. Whereas the green clique and the black clique, even though they do share an edge, they are not as connected as they could be. So they don't get an edge in the uh, transformed to instance. And now, uh, this enormous instance um, will have a triangle exactly if this thing has a six clique. And you can see that these three guys will form a triangle. And indeed, they do, even, they do form a six clique in the original instance. Uh, so the running time now, then, is the dimension of the matrix or the number of vertices in the resulting graph to the omega. So that's going to be n to the omega k over 3. And so the, the thing to note here is that omega is less than 3. So this is 2.3 divided by 3, rather than 3 be divided by 3, which would be the obvious thing. So uh, uh, independence head and clique are the same among friends. I guess then you can just put a number of dummy vertices in there, and then the reduction should still go. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. but, but this is surprising, but it shouldn't. I mean, yeah, it's surprising because matrix multiplication is surprising. And then, uh, um, yeah. Uh, just to show you one um, of the more recent algorithms that I particularly like, another surprising thing you can do in polynomial time is to, given a polynomial like this one, quickly check if the polynomial is the zero polynomial. So you can all try to do that in your head. Is this the zero polynomial if I give it like this? And, and uh, as you will all observe, the only thing you can do is to factor these things out. And that, so that's roughly going to be exponential in the uh, length of the polynomial. The answer is yes. Um, 
So that's, this is the question we want to so, uh, answer. And there is a surprising algorithm for that, uh, which is far better than uh, trying all points uh, or factoring the polynomial. Uh, and that is exploiting the fact that we all know from, from calculus that polynomials don't have too many zeros. So unless f is the zero polynomial, then in a random point, it's not going to be zero. So this is the uh, Schwartz, Sippel, Lipton. More and more authors are added to this lemma. DeMille, yeah. Um, so again, a surprising, uh, well-known algorithm um, and, uh, and this takes an hour or two to, to do in all details. I just want to give you the gist of this. Here's an instance to Hamiltonicity. I will construct a polynomial by decorating the uh, edges of the original instance with formal variables and then consider this polynomial. So I can always define this. Right? So it's a, it's a sum over all permutations of the product of the um, um, variables appearing on, on that permutation. So the permutations include, uh, usefully, uh, the Hamiltonian cycle. So here's one permutation through the graph. So here I can draw it here. So that's going to give us a polynomial with a bunch of terms, one of which is exactly this permutation, which goes uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x7. So here it is. So this is not going to be the zero polynomial because this had a Hamiltonian path. Unless, since the computation is in a finite field, it's canceled by something else. And that's exactly what we need to avoid, for instance, uh, these permutations. So this is also a permutation of the, uh, of the vertices. But it's not a Hamiltonian cycle. So in this world, it will give us, it will give us um, the terms x2, x7, x10, 2, 7, 10, followed by 4, 8, 11. 4, 8, 11, but there's another permutation that will give us exactly the same terms, and here it is. So this permutation, and then this cycle followed in the other direction. So 11, 8, 4, 11, 8, 4. So if we do this in, a, in an algebra with the proper properties, then this thing and this thing are the same as, long, as soon as these are associative. So in characteristic two, um, these will cancel. So this is one of the three major tricks to, you need to, to make this work. I have this example only to show you that there is a way to transform a combinatorial question about the existence of cycles and graphs into a question that boils down to evaluating a polynomial in a sufficiently precisely defined uh, finite field. It has to have characteristic two, has to be associative, and, and um, yeah, this still doesn't work, and it's not even fast. but. Um, Many, many details are, are, are ruled out. But in the end, you want to know, is this the zero polynomial? And it's going to be the zero polynomial exactly if this is not Hamiltonian with, high, with some probability. So that gives you a randomized algorithm for Hamiltonicity in time 1.66 to the n, 1.67 maybe? I'm not sure, actually. And. Um, yeah, there are lots of beautiful uh, papers written in this. So the, thing, the three things I showed you all transform uh, our problem P into some other problem that we already know is easy. So we have these three examples, matrix multiplication, this uh, two-sum problem, and, uh, and polynomial identity testing. So here you then have to work hard to understand what exactly is this transformation that gives us, gets us from our known problem from our given problem to one of the tiny handful of known problems that are hard. Um, so there is one other technique which, uh, which is a, a very clean here where you take P and then you uh, always apply the same transformation called the zeta transform of this problem and then you end up with whatever is here and then you try to do something about this. So, so in, in this family of problems the transformation is given and then you are faced with the result and have to find a clever algorithm for this. Here, your uh, algorithms are given, and you try to find a transformation that gets you there. And luckily, I don't have time for the zeta transform, even though it's my favorite thing. So, so this is a, there's a very clean way of explaining this, where you take a problem, transform this um, 
to, uh, to this problem basically by summing the original problem H over all subsets, and that gives you another problem. And then sometimes you're in luck, and this problem actually can be solved faster than you thought. And then you transform it back. So both the transformation back and forth are typically exponential time. And uh, the solutions here are also often, but not always, exponential time. There's one famous uh, uh, counterexample uh, due to Riser, who was the first to discover this, that you can transform the question of counting the number of perfect matchings in a graph into this. And going from here to there is exactly the zeta transform. And um, these problems turn out to be polynomial time computable. But the zeta transform itself takes exponential time. So the entire thing takes exponential time. And uh, that's another example for coloring. But I'm luckily out of time. Um, so that's it. Um, so maybe one uh, final remark about this. Um, in particular, the later problems here, certainly these three techniques, sorry, these three techniques, have this, uh, op have this property that we are, in order to find a non-trivial exponential time algorithm, we exploit non-trivial polynomial time algorithms. So, uh, the examples I showed you here uh, exploit these in a positive, good, and happy fashion in that I'm, I'm trying to actually solve a problem faster by exploiting some other polynomial time problems uh, a faster algorithm. But what is becoming clear uh, during the later years, in which I think belief will be a, a theme, of course, will be that, that this works in the other direction as well. But maybe at least in this perspective, it shouldn't have been a surprise that uh, hardness results for exponential time problems imply hardness results for polynomial time problems exactly because Algorithms for polynomial time problems implied and have for a long time implied uh, sub-exponential time or non-trivial algorithms for, for exponential time problems. And with this optimistic and somewhat programmatic uh, comment, I end my talk perfectly on time and thank you for your attention. Questions ruining the perfect perfection of the timing. <laughs> uh, no one dares. So, thanks again.